Now I'm ready. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. All right. Let's call this meeting to order. This is our very first meeting, Residential Housing Committee. Uh, Director Worthington. Sure. Um, well, good morning. Welcome. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, I made a, a, a um, I'm going to call it a framework on the agenda since this is the first meeting. Um, but kind of outline some of our ideas and, and the way we'll proceed through this meeting. But let's start with just introductions of everybody here and kind of what they're doing, what, what their duties are. And uh, I'll start, I guess, I'm James Worthington, I'm Development Services Director, County Engineer. Uh, we oversee everything to do with construction in, in Douglas County. Um, not part of the city, though. The city has their own jurisdiction, so this is just county. Next. Ron Roberts, I'm the planning and zoning manager, also code enforcement and business occupation. Travis McDonald, I'm the assistant county engineer, uh, do plan reviews of new subdivisions coming in and, and general permitting. Ramona Jackson Johnson, chairman of the board of commissioners and the vice chairman of the residential development committee. Brian Keel, I'm the engineering manager at Water and Sewer Authority. Very good. Kelly Robinson, vice chairman of the board of commissioners and chairman of this committee. Uh, Mark Keel, county administrator. Johanna Walmack, clerk of the planning and zoning board. And the voting members are, who are the actual members? I know it's chairman and Mr. Robinson, me and you. And, and Travis, I believe, is the okay. first one. Mm -hmm. Ron. No. All right, um, I guess next order of business is, is to establish some expectations of the committee, some, some long-term goals. What are we looking to achieve here? You know, what's the expected outcome of this committee? And I don't know if anybody wants to jump in. I guess this is open for discussion, but what's, what's the hopes? Thank you, Chair. I'm always going to yield to you. Um, you appointed this committee. Any thoughts initially? Um, the, the hopes and the goals of this committee is to, first of all, uh, show and prove that we are open for business, number one, and to uh, at least uh, unify our efforts to, uh, first of all, have some dialogue and discussions with our, um, <clears throat> with our housing uh, authorities, also not only with them, but also with our uh, Stakeholders, all the ones like our villagers, our uh, what else, uh, investors, yeah, and then investors <coughs> to make sure that we all on one page, and uh, certainly so we can spur the growth and movement because Douglas County was the last, I believe, in uh, the state of Georgia to be number one move pipe farms, and also we noticed that our movement here is it's a little lagging behind. And we want to see what we can do to, to move the ball forward. Uh, and also, uh, Commissioner Robinson, I know you had some other things that you probably wanted to do. My, my vision is to see what we can do to compete, because we definitely want to compete. And we cannot compete if we all work in a vacuum. Um, so with that being said, I'll yield back to you, Chairman of the Committee, so you can. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and, and County Administrator, do you see this committee being involved in some of the things that come before planning and zoning? Or are we going to keep those separate? Um, that's up to the committee, but we already have a plan and zoning, but it goes to plan and zoning board as far as any new rezonings, um, but that's up, that's up to the committee, that's yet to be decided. James, thoughts? Um, I think on the, on the, I guess, standard cases where we have planning and zoning board reviewing cases. I don't think this committee would need to be involved, but maybe on um, code changes, changes to policies or procedures, mm -hmm. might be a good idea to have a recommendation from the committee. Only dealing with housing though, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thoughts? Uh, you know, we're involved in the planning and zoning to a limited extent. <coughs> well, reviewing from you know, impacts to our development regulations and such. Um, I would really yield to my colleagues that are more involved in the planning and zoning process to you know, determine what kind of recommendations are appropriate from this committee. Ron, anybody can weigh in for your thoughts? Um, 
I would say that I would tend to agree with James. I think you know the county's going to position itself with, the, with these new studies where we're going to be looking at a different type of housing that we haven't seen before. And so staff's going to be really tasked with, with, with making some changes to the codes mm -hmm. that allow for different square footages, maybe different mixture of housing, probably something the county hasn't seen. Mm -hmm. Yes, I would say definitely in those cases it probably has to come through this committee. But your typical rezoning, yeah, so again, that's up to the committee, but just thinking out loud, I would say no. So for clarity, we would have potentially a recommendation from this committee to give to the PNZ board to still approve or, or review code changes. Is that what you are thinking? Yeah, recommendation to approve code yeah. changes. But we're going to make that to exception, right? We don't want to be up the redundant to the kind of million board, right? Right. So I'm saying uh, only when it, as it applies to residential housing code codes, code specific changes. to those codes, not all of the typical plans on duties. Mm -hmm. An example of that might be in the Lero study, the corridor study is recommending a, that we put in place PUDs along the corridor so we can kind of like control the, the land use um, as people come in for rezoning and things of that nature. That might be something that we want to vet out a little bit and get the support and uh, clarity around and feedback from this committee before moving forward. I think another example would be um, if we approach any changes to like minimum square footage of housing. Mm -hmm. Where it's something we can go in depth and a study on, and look into, and then make it on, you know, some kind of suggestion to the PNZ board of potential change. Okay. And, and um, Chairman of the committee, I also I would like to see us do some uh, work together to benchmark and look at what other counties are doing. What are, how are they uh, coming successful in attracting more builders to come to <coughs> particular counties? And I know I mentioned the word compete earlier, and that's going to be that platform for uh, competing, is to build a case so we can determine what we need to do to get ahead of the other counties or either to stay right with them. Um, and, that, and I believe once we build uh, that portfolio of information, that will kind of give us an idea of which direction we want to go. We certainly will need to establish uh, a relationship with our builders and our investors and our developers, and I would love to see them at the table and attend some of these meetings. Chairman of the committee, I go back to you. Thank you, Madam Chair. So James, do you think you can take all these comments and make a mission statement for us? I think we'd come up with something. Very good. I might have to uh, circle back with everybody in the next meeting to make sure that we've, <laughs> we've got everything into one statement, but I think so. Okay. We've got a next meeting. Okay, well, let's keep going. All right, uh, next item of business would be updates on our current plans uh, to improve mm -hmm. reception and attract more builders to come or to stay in Douglas County. Um, and the first thing I had on there was a, an update to our pipe farm resolution. And actually, I'm going to let Brian kill. Let me take that one. All right. So um, I'm happy to report that this week we are starting construction on the first subdivision, uh, Fuller Ridge. We've got all the concrete pipe material laid out there. Our crews are starting work. Um, we're thinking we'll be in there for two or three weeks and that sucker will be done. From there, we're gonna move into Palmer Falls, um, do the same thing uh, from there into Winchester Farms. Concurrently, we have our consultant working on design plans to do Holly Springs subdivision. That's a, a much larger one, a lot more pipe we're talking about, a much larger pipe, and frankly, our, our in-house forces are not equipped to to deal with it so that one we're going to have to develop a full set of construction plans bid it out and, and hire a contractor to do that but we are uh, um, currently putting those design plans together what is holly springs yes ma'am okay. how many total subdivisions eight total subdivisions approximately uh just shy of 400 lots 380 some lots was our latest count that sounds about right. Mm -hmm. yeah. What about Legacy Park? 
Legacy Park, we've been uh, communicating with the developer there. Um, you know, there are other issues in Legacy Park besides the stormwater issue. In fact, the, the primary issues there are water and sewer infrastructure, and uh, depending on which direction they want to go with their development, whether or not the existing private infrastructure needs to become public from a water and sewer standpoint, we have um, come up with a, um, what I'll call a, a set of conditions under which we might consider accepting that private water and sewer infrastructure as public to enable them to then go in and replat for single family residential on separated lot development. Um, Madam Chair, we'll, you'll be seeing that. We're going to present that information to our board of directors, um, I believe, at Monday next work session. Okay. So you'll see a little bit more on that. Um, with the board's approval, then we'll move forward with presenting that information to the owner. Uh, if they're amenable, we would enter into a development agreement with them <coughs> and uh, and then you know, follow the course of necessary actions for us to be able to accept that infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And that, that would open the door for them to uh, continue the development as, as they wish, which we've just recently confirmed they, they are still wanting to pursue the single family residential, I believe it's 40 lots, uh, separate privately owned lots. And I'll add to that, I had discussions with Mr. Snoop and he indicated to me they were pursuing the, the residential, single family residential pathway, I'll call it. And um, it, as long as they can keep going down through there, then I guess on the county's end, we have just standard policies and procedures, no real hurdles that they have to get over. Um, they do always have the option if they just can't make ends meet or whatever with the residential pathway, they can revert back. There's some procedures that have to go, but they could go back to um, condos and things where they were at. And that would kind of alleviate some of the issues with WSA. So there's two distinct pathways there. And as long as they keep going down the one Mark, are you okay with this? Mm -hmm. Madam Chair? Yeah, I'm okay. Just add one more comment. I uh, would like to see, uh, and I know this is certainly from a marketing component, if maybe we can, can get a, a nice flyer out, something maybe a uh, postcard type large flyer with both uh, Douglas County's uh, Development Authority and WSA saying we are open for business, uh, sent to those developers or investors, so we can, you know, we're talking in this room, but I want them to know that it is real. So how can we uh, message, get that message out? I'm just thinking outside the box. Um. And it, it shouldn't cost a lot to do this because simply it's not that many builders. I, I'm sure we can do something. I'm trying to think if there's any database. You might know of a database that would have all the builders over and anything in it already. I mean, we would have we, some. We have our same. usual we suspects have that are under development now. We have you know, we've certainly got our database of active so Maybe projects. we can compile something between us and the sure. development authority to, to compile a mailing list. And yeah, some of the ones that hadn't built in years, you know, yeah, you would yeah, have those in your... Right. Yeah, what we're seeing before the crash, it was a lot more local builders, local developers. We saw the same people here time and again. Uh, and here recently, it's more out of town. Uh, larger. Yeah, larger mm -hmm. builders, the larger right. developers right. Are, are coming. And, you know, there's a, always a learning process when they're coming into a new area. So that's sure. one of the challenges. But it also makes it hard to know who who to reach out to on a, when you're talking about national scale. Mm -hmm. The um, the Westside Home Builders Association might be able to help with contacts for the for the local guys. Um, I, I attend their monthly meetings and I can reach out to their chairman and try to get a list of contacts from them. Okay. Who's the contact? I mean, who's the chairman now? That's Chris Chris Collier, Chris Collier mm -hmm. still is. I think he's uh, he's trying to transition in the near future, but for now he's still holding the reins. And so we're just looking for some kind of a postcard type thing that's got our logos and says we're open for business and you may even just have questions, a couple, comments, reach out. A couple out of little to bullets, some of those things that we've changed or, you know, just a few. We've done this, we've done that, so they don't know exactly how we've changed. That would be important. 
Yeah. And then Rick. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, let's keep going. All right. Uh, next, we have update on meetings with other municipalities where we will compare policies and procedures. Travis, you want to give us a quick update on that? Sure. So uh, we reached out to Cobb County, Pauling County, and the city of South Fulton uh, to uh, talk to them about their uh, process and uh, fees that they assess for new developments. Um, and the main takeaways were uh, that we're, we're pretty much in line with, with our neighbors. Uh, Cobb County, I'd say that uh, their fees are significantly lower, although I don't think that uh, fees are the main issue for any of the developers that we've talked to. Uh, our fees are still generally pretty low when you're talking about the, what the developers are getting out of their projects. And the last time we revised those was Long early 2000s. Yeah, it's been a while since we've revised the fee structure. All right. So, whereas for a land disturbance permit, just from the county, not talking about WSA, but uh, where we we might be charging three thousand dollars, Cobb County is charging five hundred dollars. Well, I don't think that twenty five hundred dollars is making or breaking a, a new subdivision coming in. But that is one difference that we did see. Uh, Holly County, we're right in line with with their. Uh, with their fees. They're actually a little bit higher than us. Um, and overall, everyone has a, just about the same uh, review schedule as far as getting something approved through the process. And I'll, I'd like to add in on that. Um, so Cobb County has similar staff, but uh, economy of scale where they're doing about tenfold on the developments, and 10 times the size of the county. And, you know, so it's a They've got the same kind of positions, but so they've got so much more, so many more permits covering that cost compared to what we have. Yeah, I think it's unrealistic to expect that Douglas would be able to match the fee structure of a county, you know, four or five times its size. Um, and James Travis, I might also add, I, I, I was able to attend the, the meeting with Cobb, I didn't make the one with Paulding, but my impression talking to Cobb was, um, from a complexity and timeline standpoint, I think we've got them licked. They, they talked about having, I don't know, a dozen different departments and for a developer to have to deal with, you know, possibly 8, 10, 12 different departments to get the permit, I, I came out of there thinking, boy, that, that's a cumbersome process. To me, it's, it's a lot easier to do business here and get a permit out of Douglas. And maybe again, that is because we're not as big, we're not, you know, we're a smaller machine, so there's less moving parts. But some of the remarks that um, I forget who was saying we talked to, um, but, you know, he, he made it sound like here the developer comes in the door and then they've got to deal with you know all these different departments all over the county. And I I was not even able to get a um, a, a good idea of the timeline out of them. You know, I mean, you, you come in here and, and we'll tell you, you know, between the county and us. Two weeks. Mm -hmm. You know, we gotta have something in two weeks. Um, you know, he said something to the effect of, "Well, it's kind of up to the different departments." And I thought, "Well, what's the?" Uh, I think I even asked him, "What is the expectation of each individual department to return, you know, a review or a response?" Mm -hmm. uh, my understanding was there isn't one, um, and I thought that's that's kind of cumbersome. So, from from everything that we've heard from the development community. Time is a lot more important than you know, the fees. Travis, like you said, a thousand dollars, twenty-five hundred dollars, three thousand dollars. They don't care as, as long as they can get their plans through and get going because time is money. On the, I guess piggybacking on that, Paulton County when we went and met with them, their policies and procedures were very similar, with the exception that WSA here is an authority, and that that's kind of makes things a little different. But. Um, we, I would say we're a step ahead on um, digital formatting. Uh, they still do a lot of stuff on paper, a lot of logs on paper, a lot of, you know, tracking everything is in big ledger books and that's it. They didn't have, you know, spreadsheets or any of that kind of stuff. So, 
and um, trying to sell them. Did they do all my plan with you? Hobbin County does not, Cobb County does. And so we offer that. So I guess overall, I, I don't think there's anything significant about our policies or procedures as far as the review process that are causing anything to be stacked. You know, Cobb County seems to be, their numbers are, are well above ours as far as what they're permitting. I don't think it's got to do with the permit process. I'll just add, you know, from a from a staff kind of nuts and bolts perspective, Travis and and our guys, we have been working on just little ways to refine the submission submission and return process, just to minimize some of the back and forth. Yeah, to make it seem like it's more street. seamless between WSA and the right, county right. instead of you know us saying, oh, it's on WSA and them saying it's on right. us. Uh, well, and that communication behind the scenes so that the developer. Um, just sees one seamless review. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's important from a perception standpoint. I, I will say, I, I don't think we've identified a lot of areas where we can really speed up you know, the overall time frame. I, I'll come back to, I think we do pretty well there. Uh, we're pretty competitive compared to our neighbors. And, and I hear that from developers too. You, you know, talk to a developer that does business in the city of Atlanta, and you know they say it's it's a dream working out here, <laughs> but it, it's all about perspective. Um, but there yeah. there are always improvements that we can make, and, and we are um, you know on the staff level continuing to work on those little nuts and bolts type of things. Chairman, what about you, James? And other services, any improvements? Uh, well, so we've been working with WSA on some of these, you know, going back and forth, cutting out some of the. So cutting out making the developer or the builder the middle one. Right. And, and trying to do behind the scenes discussions and, and speeding things up. So that's, you know, we're open, we're, we're looking for ideas. Uh, we're continuing to ask for suggestions. So, you know, I'm not saying we're there and nothing will change. I think things will improve. Things, you know, it may be a little baby step at a time to get something to change. Because this, this process has been the same for decades so it's been refined and been refined and been refined the biggest change now to me is back to what travis said that we used to have a, the bulk of our builders were, were local and now we're getting more national builders so the delivery and pickup of permits and payment of permits is different because instead of having their permit person run down and drop off plans, they're, they're mailing, or they want more online, or they want to pay my credit card, or, or things of that nature. So it's not so much a change that needs to be made on our end, but it's a change that needs to be made to accommodate them. And so we're, we're open to that, and we're doing those as they come up. Can we take credit cards? Yeah, we, we take credit cards on a multitude of things. I won't say everything, but there are, so all of your builders, they can pay for permits, inspections, all of that on, we got several different software programs between us, but the blueprint software, we accept credit cards. That's all of your building inspections, heating, electrical, plumbing. Builders can choose to do that if they want. They don't have to, it's not a requirement. They can still pay in-house. Um, so there are options, it's not a requirement. So I'm not sure what we also Yeah, we take credit cards for any kind of fee payment. Mm -hmm. Do you take them over the phone? We can, yeah. Do we? Uh, in certain circumstances, finance kind of frowns on that because of security. So we have done it um, in very specific scenarios where I talk with finance and we get approved through them, but in general we don't. Anything to this? Mm -hmm. I'm good. I'm good. Yep. Let's keep going, James. All right. Uh, uh, update on agenda. discussions with industry experts and leaders. So we've had multiple meetings over the last, I don't know how far this has been going back, three or four months now, I guess, mm -hmm. but where we've met with quite an array of, of different industry experts, uh, builders, lenders, developers, um, realtors, school board, 
lot, lots of input from a lot of different folks. Um, and we've kind of been compiling ideas and things. The, the biggest, I guess, the upfront issue was the pipe farm issue, which I'll say at this point is resolved, and it may not be complete, but it's the issue itself is, is resolved during the process of getting resolved. Some of the next things um, that I'll say, and I'll let y'all chime in in a second, but some of the things that kind of resonated with me that, that I heard a lot of was minimum square footage um, versus uh, quality. A lot of the folks, a lot of we'd really like to build a smaller house, but a higher end house, a higher quality house. Mm -hmm. um, and that seemed to be nearly, it didn't matter who was doing the talking, that was a, a common point that came up from most of the outsiders. You know, let's can we build a smaller house, but build it nicer. So we were looking into some different ways of, of doing that. And I would say in one of the next meetings, maybe that'll be something we'll bring as a proposal, some options on that. Quality is a very difficult thing to enforce because what, you know, quality is kind of opinionated. What, do you, what you like versus what I like or can be. There can it's, be two houses that meet code, they're totally different. Right. And it's hard to codify as, as to what, you know, uh, say all brick, craftsman style, or whatever, but you can have a brick house that's poorly built, or you can have a final side house that's very well built. And it, that's what I'm trying to wrap my head around is a, is a way to put that in writing, a way that inspectors or permit clerks could say, yes, this qualifies or no, it don't. So far, uh, I've done some research with other municipalities, um, with some other organizations like Earthcraft. Um, you can do Earthcraft certifications. Um, there are some hurdles along the way, so I'm not to a point where I'm ready to say this is the answer. But I do think that's something we still need to investigate. 1,800 square feet? Correct. That's the current minimum, yeah. And okay, what are you thinking? Well, so I've asked a bunch of folks what what their <coughs> goal would be, and um, I've heard 1,400, 1,500, 1,600. Mm. I don't, would either of y'all say they kind of honed in on one square footage that would be a go-to? Well, some of the, um, some areas of, say, I think it's Brooklyn allows townhomes and those sizes are grandfathered in, and I think that those go down to 1,400. 10% right around, yeah. And, and um, that seems to be fairly popular. We've got a new phase of Brooklyn coming in, so I certainly, I, I wouldn't say below 1,400, but that might be a, a good starting point. And I think a lot of this flips around kind of like what I was saying earlier. It's not that, that the county needs a change, it's that the demand from the outside, the millennials, the the desire for housing is changing as far as what people would want. You know, younger folks don't necessarily want to build 3,000 square foot brick three acre lot. And, you know, they may want a little town hall that's real nice, but just small or no maintenance or, you know, so those are some of the things we kind of we got to roll with the changes on. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, we'll dig a little bit deeper on that. But, yeah, I think we'll have something in one of our upcoming meetings as, as either as a springboard just bouncing off or something that, you know, appears to be stuff. But either you don't have anything to do that. Uh, I mean, you mentioned millennials are, are wanting, not wanting that brick on, you know, three acre kind of development, but it's also uh, get a lot of comments about the aging population. Mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, looking at zoning cases that come in, a lot of it is people want, um, you know, concessions because they need to take care of their aging parents and they want to do it on their property when they need an accessory apartment or that sort of thing. So mm -hmm. um, I think the aging population is definitely changing the, what's, this, what's desired as far as housing. Mm -hmm. Very good. We're good on that. Anybody else? All right, the next uh, thing I had was new discussion items. And I, I guess we can start. We've got some visitors. I don't know if um, 
Anybody wants to come forward to add anything? No, that's up to you. Okay. Well, first up, R Russell, y'all are up first. Come on up. Come to the table. We welcome you. Which one? We're recording this one. Mm -hmm. So, can I be at the podium? Mm -hmm. I can be doing that at the podium. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Being recorded, so oh. it's being told by us. Oh, it is. Okay, thank you. So, please state your name. Sure. Good morning, um, Madam Chairwoman, Vice Chair Robinson. My name is Yasmin Murray. I'm here from H.J. Russell and Company, along with my colleagues Delilah Wynn Brown and Mac Hancock. Um, they will talk a little bit later about their expertise and what they do for H.J. Russell and Company. Uh, thank you so much for having us here this morning. We appreciate it. This has been a very stimulating conversation, definitely, for me. Um, and at H.J. Russell and Company, I am the Executive Vice President and General Counsel. And some of you may be familiar with H.J. Russell and Company. Others of you may not. This year, we celebrate our 60th anniversary since we were incorporated in the City of Atlanta, in the City of Atlanta and State of Georgia. And we have four areas of operation. We are commercial builders, we are commercial developers, we are property managers, and we also do what's called program management. And program management, for those of you who are not familiar with that, um, simply means on um, construction or development projects, we act as the owner's representative. Um, but I'm here today to focus really around um, our work and our experience in the property management area at um, Commissioner Robinson's request. And we've been um, in the property management business for as long as we've been in business, almost 60 years. And when Mr. Russell um, entered sort of the property management foray, when he poured into that industry, it was really motivated by his desire to bridge the equity gap for um, a lot of pe people of color, people of lower income, people of moderate income, so that they had a decent, safe place to live in and around the city and around the metro area. And you know, after he started, that began to um, evolve into providing areas for people to live who are more lower, um, lower income. A lot of you are familiar with a lot of the public housing that we had in the city of Atlanta. And when that got demolished, you know, Mr. Russell felt compelled to do something for these people. So we took a lot, a lot more of them in, and we began managing a lot more of what's called subsidized housing, basically property layered with different types of subsidies or discounts that the government provided, whether they were um, Section 8 vouchers or um, home fund vouchers and so forth, which my colleague Matt could talk better, um, more about. Um, and so we were in that area for quite a long time, but one of the things that we've noticed was it's not, it didn't make for the best recipe um, for housing for people to provide safe and quality housing. Um, we began to realize we needed to modify that approach. And a lot of that, we, um, we began to realize that we needed to look at different concepts. And some of the concepts that we've started to embrace, which both Delilah and Mac will talk a little bit more about, are what's called mixed communities or mixed developments where we combine housing with retail, with other amenities, or um, what we call placemaking. A lot of people in the development um, arena are talking about placemaking and realize the importance of placemaking. Basically, that means um, providing people with a place where they can work, live, and play and ensuring that that place is affordable. And so, in a way, I feel like we've sort of come full circle from where Mr. Russell started in providing you know, safe, affordable housing, not just for um, low income, but really moderate income people. A lot of times when you hear the word affordable, there's a negative um, connotation to it. People think about um, you know, very, very low income um, individuals. But quite honestly, in and around the city of Atlanta and the metro area, there are a lot of people of moderate income who cannot afford housing and you know, live further and further away from the city just to be able to have a safe and quality and decent place to live. So affordable housing now, that has changed. You know, we're focusing a lot on moderate income, middle income, in addition to low income people, and focusing a lot more on you know, innovative concepts, innovative ways to integrate affordability into um, into housing, and you'll hear Delilah talk a little bit about that, such as workforce housing, again about placemaking, mixed-use developments, and so forth. 
And so that'll, that is my piece. Just wanted to give you all a high level overview of you know, where Russell is, who Russell is, what we're focusing on now when we talk about development and property management. And I will let the veterans here um, delve a little bit dig um, deeper into the technicalities or the technical aspects of that. So I can take questions now or I can wait for questions afterwards. We'll wait. Okay. Good morning, everyone. My name is Mac Hancock. I'm with H.J. Russell and Company. I run both the property management and the development arms of the company. Um, let me just start by saying two weeks on building permit turnaround. You guys should put up balloons yes. and make that on your flyer. That needs to be on your flyer. That's fantastic. We, we build and develop and redevelop our own assets a lot in the city of Atlanta and Fulton County. And two weeks would be something we would be very Put it in flash. <laughs> yes it should be it could be your sales pitch trust me two weeks start to finish and I love the fact that you guys talked about a behind the scenes collaboration um, that's very important to a developer uh, I think you're you're moving absolutely in the right direction uh, we primarily focus on development of uh, multifamily both kind of we've done condominiums we've done some single family and mixed type properties um, in the urban setting more so, where we've had some for sale townhomes, some for sale condominiums, um, engaged with rental, uh, multifamily rental as well. Um, Ms. Murray mentioned uh, that we talked a little bit about um, our mixed income, mixed source kind of properties, and those we find are the most successful. Um, where you there, there are lots of concepts out there. You could go into a lot of them. Cobb County is doing some, certainly Fulton County, uh, where you're you're looking at putting some form of retail or or entertainment type into the development and combining maybe a single family section with a multifamily section. Um, one of the gentlemen in the room mentioned generational considerations that we're starting to have. We're all we're all aging. Whether we like it or not, each of us is doing it. Mm -hmm. and, and it is a, a focus. We've done some very successful projects where we've had some uh, multifamily condominiums geared specifically for seniors, 62 and older, 55 and older, depending on the programmatic things and incentives you can get, coupled with um, both market rate rental and some rental of townhomes, and it brought allowed say a, a, a family in the 40, 45 uh, age group with some, some teenage children to be able to be near the elderly parents without combining the households, but be close. Uh, we see that that's successful and that and when you address it in a multiple income band using various federal and state incentives that are out there, um, not getting too full affordability, but allowing affordability. Uh, I did some research on Douglas County uh, just to kind of get familiar and ready for this meeting. And one of the things that, um, that was important was that your median income for 2018 was 61904 And that really kind of varies depending on whose report you're looking at. I saw one that said 60988 so it's, it's somewhere in that range. But what I found interesting in digging in that 41% of that income fell below $50,000. That's a, that's a large number when you get into the other bands of where it falls. That affordability, of course we hear that word all the time. It's happening all over the country. You see it, you hear it. Um, certainly in urban areas, but also in much of the suburban areas and even some of the rural areas where affordability has crept away. And I think that's important. That's something we focus on finding um, really creative ways to stack the affordability, to allow the affordability. We're serving uh, in a 41% in a of your income under 50,000, I think that's probably gonna be your first year teachers, your elementary school teachers, your police, perhaps your firemen, um, maybe even city uh, workers, county workers who are in the court systems. Um, that's probably where it's falling, but that's a big number. Actually, 8.6% of your population in 2018 was teachers and educational workers. Um, so that's, that's a big piece of your population in Douglas County. And gearing towards that 
is probably something that would be good for you all to look at finding a way to do that um, with offering everything that you want to offer. Um, we've <coughs> creative ways. We're happy to be involved in any discussions or participate in any way. I uh, live in South Fulton myself, and, and <laughs> as Commissioner Robinson learned the other day, do all my shopping on Chapel Hill Road. So I just <laughs> um, <laughs> just because it's you've got great shopping and opportunities. So um, housing here, you have a total of 976 what they're calling affordable units, mm -hmm. and that would include anything being run by your housing authority of Douglas County, um, any housing choice vouchers being issued by them, and any subsidized properties like a Douglas Village or uh, the Fowler community here. Um, 433 of them have subsidy on them currently. 34.81% um, of your population of households are renter households in Douglas County. That's, that's pretty high. The city of Atlanta is 50.1%, but that's expected. It's mostly rental inventory. But um, I couldn't really <coughs> discern where that fell. Um, a lot of it fell in three census tracts, and it seemed to be a mixed census tract. I think 80402 was one of them that stood out that had a good population of rental. Um, and a, your, your population has increased 2.21% uh, as an average since January of 2017, and it's continued to, con uh, looks like it's going to continue to increase by about 1.5 to 1.8% projected over the next five years each year. So you've got some opportunity for development, certainly. I would like to commend again that you're doing, you know, getting together in this arena and doing what you're doing to attract the developers and make sure it's the right development is really important. And that two-week thing, I just can't get past that. That's just, two weeks would be wonderful. You know, <laughs> where do I sign up? <laughs> and that's really all I have. Do you want, do you have questions for me or do we want to do that all at, at the end? Okay, and I'm going to bring up Delilah Wynn Brown, who is a creative veteran in the field of doing all kinds of, of workforce and mixed use housing. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Good morning again, everyone. Mm -hmm. Again, I'm Delilah Wynn Brown. I'm the Director of Real Estate Development for H.J. Russell and Company. And um, I, my background is architecture and planning and real estate and economic development. Um, and as Max said, I have worked um, in um, developing um, in town and um, different types of residential. I've also done program management. So I kind of live in both worlds on the owner side and the developer side, understand both. And once again, I just have to say, echo Mac, <laughs> two weeks, that's tops. <laughs> I mean, it really is. And really being able to sit down with developers, <coughs> um, you know, like you said, a seamless process. That is so important because having to move through, like with the city of Atlanta, where you're going through, it's at least 12 different departments. They are probably more if I count them actually. That makes a difference. Um, and paying a little bit more is worth it if you can get through that. So I would put that out there as well. Um, today, I'd like to talk about two things, placemaking and workforce housing. Um, with placemaking, um, really kind of setting out your iconic places in Douglas County. And this is the planning side of me talking. Um, we can just find areas that have land and put housing here, there, everywhere, or put retail next to the highways and all of that. But if you are actually trying to compel people <coughs> to come to your area, it's important for you to go through that process of identifying who you want to be as Douglas County. Think about iconic, plus, you know, Atlantic Station, you know. Who would have thought the old steel mill would, you know, and it, it's not an authentic monument there, but there's a monument, there's a park, there's water, there's all these features, which they really could have gone through and just stamped out high-rise buildings in that area as well, but they would not have created a place. There would not be an iconic 
um, structure there that draws people there. So for Douglas County, each area, you know, and it doesn't have to be on that grand scale, but each area has something to offer and has something that you can design around where you start to do this mixed housing mm -hmm. size and, and, and whether it's millennials and the senior citizens and, um, you know, it's always a better neighborhood and community when you have that mixture of people rather than segregating people by socioeconomic standards. So one of the things that, that we have done, and I will pass these out just for everyone to kind of look at, is workforce housing. We have, um, these are just the renderings. Um, we've partnered, and, and most of the time to make these numbers work, we must partner. <laughs> so we have partnered with MARTA because the land that this particular um, project, this is the King Memorial um, Transportation Oriented Development. So we've partnered with MARTA. We are on land next to one of their stations. We also have a TAD, Tax Allocation District, from the City of Atlanta to help bring the cost of construction down. Because no matter how we slice it or dice it, construction in the metro area is sky high. And you just can't make those numbers work. Mm -hmm. So um, one of the councilpersons in the um, uh, City of Atlanta, all of them are saying it now, <laughs> but um, one of them started out saying, you know, if you have a college student who graduates and they're making $50,000 a year, that's pretty good. But they can't afford to live <laughs> in the city of Atlanta in the apartments there because when you look at a third of your income and do all of those calculations, they don't qualify. And there's something wrong with that so that not only kids coming out of school can't live there, but the people who work at the hotels, who work at the schools, who work at all these places can't live there. So we partner, we find ways to bring down the cost of the development to a point where um, most of the time there are requirements for 10% of the units in a, um, in a development like this to be affordable we've been able to take this to 33%. This is an approximately 300 unit complex. We are doing 100 units of affordable, which defined as 80% of the Atlanta um, income, median income. So that is how we've been able to do this project. And you can see it, it, it looks like many of the other um, apartments in Atlanta. We're not trying to bring the quality down. We're trying to keep the quality up and put together a package that makes it still work. And um, so I would leave with you, I know you've got a, a much more on your agenda, but I would leave with you as you're considering developers coming in, whether it's Russell, whether it's anyone, please go through the process of your placemaking. How do you want? You know, I saw the three different nodes. You got Lee, um, Lee Road, and then you've got the various nodes that you're looking at developing. Look at those and say, you know, what what do we want people to remember when they come to these places? And then put together the different strategies to be able to get this type of project um, together, um, put together with the developer. And the lenders are liking this. They're, they're, they're liking this. There are lenders out there that have a mission mm -hmm. of affordable housing. Um, it doesn't all have to be HUD. It can be different combinations of things. So I would say that you're in a great place um, to make a difference um, in Douglas County. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Very good. <coughs> Questions? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure we'll be in touch. Okay, thank Absolutely. you. Absolutely. Yes, we'll, I'll, we'll leave I'll piggyback on some of the things you said there about, um, you know, making a place. Some of our recent studies and things, um, if you want to talk to us, to something about Boston, and, and 
Yeah, sure. So uh, that's exactly what we, uh, you know, we just finished doing the comprehensive transportation plan where we identified the character areas, which is in a sense very similar to placement. And uh, as far as, as long as the, uh, as far as the small area study for, for Lee Road, you know, we have, um, the county has an option on that land for the next two years for the uh, economic development authority um, and looking to bring and attract something like this to get uh, to get started. Um, full build out of, of that particular place making is going to require uh, obviously the future connection all the way down to Chapel Hill. But uh, for purposes of this discussion, uh, we, I think when the, when, the city, when the county sold the old jail to the city, we we went on the market then for our own place making in the county in a sense, and that's what. That's what we've positioned ourselves the last couple of years with the studies to do, um, and I think we're we're in good shape. Uh, did have uh, some uh, conversations uh, as it related to uh, our housing study that we finished in January of 2017. Um, we we as a county are, are ahead of that. We we got really um, we did did a study with the Bleakley Group, which is the premier group for doing a study of that nature and, and with the kickoff of, of this particular committee uh, and and coupled with the perfect storm of these placemaking activities, I think we're in a good spot. Agreed. A couple of thoughts. Um, among the comments they said with our medium income is six one what? Dollars, six one nine zero four. Fifty percent? No, forty percent is less than two thousand. So there's a gap. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How do we address that? Uh, the first thing that comes to my mind is is some of the things the development authority is working on. Uh, you know, trying to target certain job fields, higher paying fields, getting getting those higher paying positions in the county. You know, so getting some of those companies that offer those positions into the county uh, seems like a good first step. Um, and then you know, hopefully everything will just fall into place after that. What I'm thinking about is the housing study, which I remember. Um, the housing study told us two things. Um, we have a lot of products at the bottom of the food chain. We got a lot of products at the top of the food chain. There's nothing in the middle market that 200 to 400 thousand. So does this group? I mean, how do we bridge that gap? How do we bridge that gap? We have very expensive homes, and we got first-time home buyers. But we have nothing in the middle. We have no move up. Put the seniors to the side for a second. And I'm putting this out there. This is something that the committee has to work on. We have to think through this, Madam Chair. Like, like, how do we fill these gaps? I mean, do we have products to offer these people if they moved up, if their income increased? Uh, yes. Um, now, as far as how it compares in volume, I'm not sure. But a lot of the homes being built now um, I would say are falling in the 250 to 350 range. Does that sound right, Travis? Somewhere in there? Yeah, I would agree. Um, so I, I've not looked at the actual economics of it to see what you know qualifies as low or medium or high, but I, that to me seems like it fits kind of in the middle. Is your is that middle portion you're referring to? Um. And I don't know the price point, but wouldn't, and I'm just going to I'll name a couple, like Palmer Falls, um, what's the one down at Chapel Hill, um, you know, eight, Holly Springs. Springs. Holly Springs. Holly Springs. Mm -hmm. We just, they don't have a final plat yet, but they, mm -hmm. they would fall in that category. Bookmark. Brook Park's kind of got there. everything. Yeah. They got everything. They've got from 14 years ago. Yeah, Whitestone. And those haven't moved in, in years. They're probably at least three, three and four. 
and I'm sure there's some other ones out there. So there are some out there, but they're not moving. So real quick, data point. How many apartments do we have? As far as number of units? Mm -hmm. Or separate? Yeah. Um, okay. Most of them are in the city. Mm -hmm. It actually has your um, properties make up just under 5% of the county's tax digest. Pay 6.2 million in, in total real estate taxes. The study that we did a few years ago, and you might see this in a second, but mm -hmm. I believe they recommended um, we, we shoot to get about, I want to say it was 900. Yeah, was 900 mm -hmm. more units over the next decade. 600 to units over five or six properties. But that includes the city. That's apartments. apartments, just apartments. Yeah, and, yeah included the city. That included the city also. So, but regardless, based on that study, you know, we would need a few of the complexes that have kind of recently been built in the city where they're somewhere between 100 and 200 units. Mm -hmm. So, we've a few of those. Anybody else? Yeah, I just have one comment. And certainly, as we capture the word affordable, I don't want us to run from that word affordable because we just talked about the different disciplines within that word affordable, such as your firemen, your teachers, and uh, nurses. Some nurses that's coming out of school, they don't start off extremely high. They start off around maybe forty-five, fifty thousand dollars a year. Um, our teachers here in Douglas County, and I can speak as mother of a teacher, they live in apartments, and um, especially if they're single. Mm -hmm. And we have quite a few single teachers. Uh, and just hoping that we could put our minds around, just start thinking outside of the box and, and see what we can do to look at some maybe additional apartments or additional condominiums or something that's affordable. Um, I believe, and I, if you could restate your name, so. Matt Hancock. Yeah, Matt. Mr. Hancock, you mentioned something about, um, I believe you said Atlanta, the, something you said, poverty rate was 50%, and you said that, what, what, it was something you said, I just want to make the, sure. Um, the rental households yeah, yeah, the rental are 50.1% percent inside the city of And Atlanta. you said Douglas County is how much? 34.8%. Rentals, that's what I wanted to ask you about there. <coughs> if you could, uh, Mr. Hancock, come back to the podium. I have questions for you. What are other, particular outside of Atlanta, what are other counties similar to the size of Douglas County doing to address affordable housing? And if you have just some ideas, if you just kind of lay on the table for us, what are they doing? Um, well, we're fortunate and we manage and develop all over the state of Georgia. So we're in some rural, some suburban, and some certainly urban areas. Um, one of the things that they're doing are really going after, I think it was Councilman Robert, or Commissioner Robinson that mentioned finding the people who are in your targeted bracket to bring them in. How to attract them is one of the big things. And, and I'm in the discussion, if you don't mind, um, I have some I'm a data person, so mm -hmm. I'm one of those people that likes love data. Okay. Um, your demographics as of 2000, the end of 2017 was the last time they were compiled for public. Uh, the demographics, the median age in Douglas County is 36.7 years old. Mm -hmm. That's true. Um, and your population is 53% female. Um, I mentioned earlier that, that uh, 61904 is your median household income. Now, I will say that Douglas County is well below the national average for poverty level. You're at 11.1% estimated, and the national average is 14.8%. Um, but your, your bands of income, you have that 41% of your population under 50,000, and then you have 10% between 50 and 75. From 75 to 100,000, you have 26 percent. From 100,000 to 200,000, you have 20 percent. And over 200,000, you have 2 percent. Mm -hmm. 
um, the average size of your household here is 2.9 persons per household. And I, I kind of took that to say, as we talk about, we, we talk about affordable and not coming away from the affordable, and, and the new word is workforce when you use different programs. So typically affordable has always been your subsidized, your, your half vouchers or your public housing or PPV. Um, that's 30% of your area medium income. Um, then you've got LIHTC, which is low income housing tax credit subsidies that builders use for multifamily quite often. It's been around since the late 80s and you mix that with conventional properties and layer those funds on. And that allows you to get to either 50 or 60% of the area median income. And for a family of three, since we just said your average household size is 2.9, for a family of three, if you were at a 50% income bracket in Douglas County, it would be uh, 33,700 gross income. Um, when you get into what we call the workforce, which is the newer band of affordable housing, that's 80% of the area median income, and for that same family of three, it allows you an income up to $53,920. So I think we could all kind of agree that the two person in that same 80% band mm -hmm. is 47920 and without having granular details of exactly what those incomes are that make up less than 50000 I would say that that would be your target audience, would be the workforce housing, mixed type housing, which is this, King Memorial project that we're talking about in multifamily. Um, and in, in you had uh, you enjoyed robust sales. Douglas County had robust housing sales last year. 1,404 right. homes were sold. And the average price, although I, I heard the comments finding something between two and four, the average price is 294920 that was sold. And of course that's skewed because you may have had, there were some in the $500,000 market if it had a house. It's, ca it's counted as residential if it had, even if it was a large tract of land with a house on it. So you have that skew of 294 is a median for what your house sales were. And, and some of the stock that we have presently available, the uh, houses that are already out there selling, it's my understanding within like a week or 14 days. So if you put your house on the market, you just need to be prepared to move because they are moving very quickly. Or if you can tell me that. Uh, I love it. <laughs> I'm a they laugh at me in our office He's because I'm a data guy. I need, I need the data. I have to have the data. I believe last year, uh, 2018 was the best year for realtors, I understand. Just it, it was. It has slowed about 3% in the Atlanta metro area overall. They mm -hmm. don't have countywide statistics, but it's slowed about 3%. Mm -hmm. And that's a number of factors. Just inventory has been very slow. Mm -hmm. um, and there is, there's been pushback on interest rates that have changed recently, not drastically. They're still at historic lows and it's a great time to buy. But um, your current inventory, you have houses as low as 68,600. There's not many of those, but there are some small, older homes in need of repair. And you have a lot of houses in the 195 to 220 range for sale and the average days on market for Douglas County in 2018 was nine. Nine days on the market. Now Atlanta was um, a little more robust. It was about six for Atlanta, but it was mostly older fix up, flip, uh, flip type things that are going on in the Atlanta. But mm -hmm. yours is nine days. That's very fast. Mm -hmm. Okay. Very good. Anything mm -hmm. else? Go ahead. Um, when you mentioned the, the 200 to 400,000 price point that we're kind of lacking, um, as part of the pipe farm discussion, uh, we have looked at uh, subdivisions that had been started and houses were going up when the crash happened. And we identified, uh, I would guess, about 25 to 30 subdivisions that have about 1,200 lots. Based off of the houses that were built in those subdivisions, um, then that was kind of the price point where things were were at when the crash happened. Now all these subdivisions are ready to go. The, the lots are ready to be built on as soon as we can get the builders to, to come and do it. Um, and that's really the price point um, where a lot of these subdivisions that are only partially built in um, are sitting at. So, that might be something that we can target. So you think this inventory will fill that gap? 
Yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. No, thank you very much. Sorry about that. Yeah. Any more thoughts? Okay. I did do a little more okay. research, but I think we're on the right track. We've got one more presentation. Uh, let's see, Mr. Callahan? Yeah. Come on up. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Chair, Commissioner, Douglas County staff. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. I am John O'Callaghan, President and CEO of Atlanta Neighborhood Development Partnership. We are a not-for-profit organization that serves all of Metro Atlanta. Uh, we are involved in single-family development. Uh, we are involved in some multifamily development and own apartments. We have a not-for-profit loan fund certified by the U.S. Treasury Department. It's a community development financial institution. And we actually provide lending to private sector developers and not-for-profit developers where affordable housing is a portion of uh, what is being developed. And we are actively engaged in what are best practices and what are learnings. It's fabulous uh, to be here with some leaders from the H.J. Russell uh, Company. Uh, Mr. Russell is just a personal hero uh, of mine, and there are many private sector players in Atlanta that are literally leading uh, the country. And my comments, uh, and this may not be for this particular committee, but I think it's an issue for the county. Y'all are appropriately focused on as we build new, <coughs> some of the population stats and some of the needs and how do you align with the market and how do you get that smaller product that may be more sustainable. Those are all critical issues. But the majority of the housing stock in five years will be the housing stock that we had today. And some statistics that came up today was that 34% of the residents of Douglas County are renters, but when we looked at the numbers of apartments, the statistic I heard was about 5% were apartments. We might need to do some digging. So what that means is the vast majority of renters are in single family homes. Uh, our organization in 2007 and early 2008, we were formed out of a partnership of Maynard Jackson, then mayor of Atlanta's third term, and the Atlanta Chamber to work on affordable and mixed income housing issues. And originally it was the city of Atlanta, and we now serve the entire region. We refocused everything based on the foreclosure crisis. And today the region is still responding to that event from 2006 through 2010. Uh, in Douglas County, you should be very proud. We are proud to be a part of what I think was one of the top neighborhood stabilization programs in the country. <clears throat> because in Douglas County, there was a partnership. We and others were invited to come in and, 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 and say, hey, we, we, we'd like to be a partner and work with the West Side Builders. How do you maximize sort of local knowledge and local builders? And those dollars in many communities were spent once, a home was sold, a few homes were bought on the second round. In Douglas County, the stewardship was amazing, and the homes were bought once and sold. The benefits were bought again and sold, bought again and sold, and there's still, this is one of the few jurisdictions in the country that still has resources. We did a study about three and a half years ago to look at some of the results of those investments. And for every dollar that was invested in then a home that was sort of in a negative equity position uh, for rehab to improve the existing housing stock, what happened was there was a new market comp in that sort of lower end. And that new market comp helped raise the values for the area, which is the other homeowners, not the home that you worked on for the other homeowners, and the county tax base, uh, $2.3 million of investment created $14.6 million worth of wealth. 
Following uh, this crisis, uh, I have not looked recently, I need to pull out the data, on the home ownership uh, rates for Douglas then and today. But what we are seeing across Metro Atlanta, that is in particularly in communities of color, that the home ownership rate is at a historic low and there has not been a recovery. So what does that mean? That means a stripping of wealth and not a recovery of wealth. So we have started to study, and we will break out the data for Douglas County. We're in the midst of our study of homes where we using the Neighborhood Stabilization Program. We're now using home funds. We're using our own capital. We're using New Markets Tax Credit, Capital Magnet, a variety of sources. But homes that were improved, a homeowner, it had been rental property or it had been distressed, that became a home ownership because home ownership properties help stabilize a community, help keep kids in the same school, the multiple benefits. And we largely serve lower income families, uh, as low as 50% of area median income, generally below 80, some are middle income. But the average family that owned a home for at least five years created $83,000 worth of wealth. So in Douglas County and this existing housing stock, when we know that the tables have turned and income and jobs is part of the equation, but wealth is very important. Stability, price appreciation is very important. What is the strategy to return Douglas to an area where we don't have such a high percentage of our single family homes in rental. There are national trends. Used to be rental homes were owned by local groups, might be an attorney, might be a doctor. They could get financing from Fannie Mae. They may own five or six homes. And when the market was down and more people needed rental, uh, they might build their portfolio. But when the market improved, they would sell through multiple listing service and it'd be likely a homeowner would buy it. Many of the home sales in Douglas County are not recorded by multiple listing service because they are purchased uh, in bulk from large equity-based rental companies. They're no longer the smaller Douglas-based businesses. These are national businesses that have financing that requires single-family homes to be rental for 30 years. They're prepayment penalties if you pull it out of the stock. So they are not selling that home that converted to rental mm -hmm. in 2010. It is not on the market for a homeowner. That's one of the reasons that you have five days on the market. Uh, so we're here as a resource. Uh, you all know your local community. We have been blessed uh, to partner with you, have learned so much from your team and how to do this neighborhood stabilization program are now uh, doing it in other means. Uh, unfortunately, in single family, we produce 100 homes a year, and we are one of the largest not-for-profits in the country. And the largest not-for-profits on multifamily are producing maybe 1,000 units a year. But in this county, in many areas of the American South, of Metro Atlanta, single family is the housing stock that exists. And we'd love to partner with you on that. If there are other projects, could be multifamily existing apartments or new apartments or new construction homes, uh, we have a relationship with Westside Builders of trying to let well, those folks know that we have capital where banks may not to be a part of the solution. And we are so encouraged uh, by the work that you are, you are doing. Uh, in suburban communities, there are not as many best practices that have been developed. So I think y'all are actually at a cutting edge and getting ahead of some of these issues. And, just from listening in on the discussion today, I was uh, very impressed. Please call on us if we can help advise. We are here uh, uh, working with our capital through a variety of sources to try to get more homeowners, but we're currently at a scale of you know maybe doing 10 or a dozen a year, and we are working uh, to lift our 100 in Metro Atlanta over the next three years to 200 and get other for-profits and not-for-profits to do the same. Thank you. Thank you. Very good. Very good. Thank you. Thoughts? Questions? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, well, I'll just comment that NSB, I do think, has been a good success 
here long term. And uh, it's been, been good work for me. How many rounds did you do? We did NSP 1, 2, and 4? Or what no, did we do? it was NSP 1 and 3. 1 and 3. That's correct. Is it still active or we pretty much have turned it all back in? Or we are in the process of, of winding down um, the NSP 1. Obviously, you know, these things generate program income, so they, they, they can continue in, uh, in, a, in a capacity there. But uh, we, we are, I looked at um, last Friday about what we could do between now and June 2020 as it relates to housing, um, because that's when HUD, and that's when they want to close down the SP1 and 3 programs. Um, I had, uh, what I was trying to do was look at what we had left in SP3, so I could get with actually AMDP and see what we could do over the, between now and June 2020 and, and the funding and we're probably looking at probably maybe six to seven, maybe eight homes, depending. Current, and we've, we've done uh, 61 homes total, total with, the, with both programs. And you're right, we are a, a non-entitlement county, so if we don't use those funds, they will go back to the state. But all the presentations, very good presentations. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Okay. All right, James, we'll just keep it moving. Well, thank you for those uh, remarks. Um, next thing I had was a future meeting schedule and frequency. Um, I don't know if there's a particular day or, or week of each month that works well for everybody, but try to set something up. And then also discuss uh, frequency. Do we want to do this monthly, bi-monthly, quarterly? Well, not certainly monthly. Maybe every other month, initially. And Madam Chair, what do you think? Because we have to wait until um, you know, um, action happens in the marketplace right. to be able to respond. So we don't get that monthly. I agree. And I, I think, you know, the first few meetings we may be able to provide some, some meat to talk about, some, some changes. Um, if the market continues the same, um, but yeah, then I would say either by month or quarterly. I don't, I'm open for whatever. I'm sure you have a preference. Yeah, I don't have many meetings. Yeah, I think uh, by month it would work out, uh, work very well for us. And also, if we could, I know we focus that we have uh, data related to our pipe bombs, but if also we could just look at every project that's being built and just roll that out. I mean, all the projects here in Douglas County, starting from the Mirror Lake area, I understand there's some activity there. Is that correct, mm -hmm. uh, county administrator? So we have activity all the way through the whole county. So we'd just like to look at it from a uh, bird's eye view if we could. I'll show you somewhere. Huh? We can, uh, yeah, some of it's on there. And then when you schedule, when you look at the schedule, the bi monthly meetings, I'll try to make sure it, we. We pick one up before the meetings just in case we have something on on the agenda that we need to review. Okay. That's yeah, that's and then work backwards or work both ways from there. Okay. Something like that. So and do y'all like um, meeting on days that there is already going to be commission meetings or work sessions or something so you already we can try that but uh, most full. of those are booked <laughs> <laughs> all right so if those days are books would y'all prefer that that same week or the opposite week same week same week okay Maybe that's good to know I, and so, speaking of kind of bird's eye view, I'll, I'll, I'll give you some things that I've got a few of these. These are residential construction permits from 2018 um, that were in subdivisions. So, this is all the ones in the subdivisions. They're scattered around. It was uh, 200 and I lost another. I think it was about 260 different houses in subdivisions. Um, I 
you know, I was kind of looking for a theme to see if there was any particular area, any particular thing that stood out as, as they were mapped, but it seems to be pretty scattered. Some of the higher numbers are um, in, so Brookmont, Anawakee, some of those, Perennial Walk at Lake Monroe, kind of this area has got a, a bulk of numbers, but right. they're still a good scattered amount throughout the county. And James, this doesn't include anything in the city, does Correct. It? This is just, just what the county has permitted. And this doesn't include single-family residences that are not in subdivisions. And we, we probably had hmm. around 50 of those style Stand ones. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So, but that's just the, and y'all can keep those if you want. I've got a few other comments. And I'll do that again <coughs> at the beginning of next year, and we'll, I'll, I'll try to work up a way to compare to see if, uh, if there's any trends that are in you know, a movement from one side of the county to the other or, or if anything appears. Um, so, anything else on that? Nope. No, okay. uh, next thing I had was possible people invited at future meetings. I had builders, lenders, developers, uh, analysts, other municipalities, I don't know if we want another municipality to come in and, and speak, but um, realtors is one I left off, but I've come to that in. But anybody got any, anything they want uh, presentations from? Anybody to come to future meetings? Definitely realtors and definitely bankers. And so would you like to have that at the next meeting? A representative from one of those fields? Okay. I want to know how the money's doing. There, you can probably talk. I, I'm sure there's somebody to talk to. There used to be bankers that would yeah. come to remember those development meetings. Metro, today. Metro line. Was yeah, fun. and they would give. Okay, here's what. Here's what the housing update looks like. Here's what the economy looks like for housing. Mm -hmm. So they would, you know, even before the crash, mm -hmm. if you want to call it a crash, <laughs> they were telling us, look, it's coming. You know, it's coming. Right. So let's yeah, do bankers. We'll, 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 we'll good. So. Okay. Um, closing remarks. Anybody got any final comments, thoughts? Good stuff. You think they did? I appreciate it. Got mm -hmm. some homework to do. So. Well, I appreciate, uh, appreciate us um, rolling up the red tape and rolling up the red carpet for our customers. And it sounds as if you all, it, you know, you talked about the different places that you visited, so you had a comparative analysis. And I believe our opportunity is around customer service, so that's huge, uh, that component. Uh, and I believe we are working on that just to show that we are unified. And it sounds like for two weeks we uh, hit a home run with our two weeks, so we just still want to have some smiles and we want to smile reading on when those customers hit the door. So the first impression is last impression. So I don't know if you all have a center of excellence for customer service at each one of your centers. You may have to put, my sister is very good with projects, I'm good, very good with people, so you might have to put somebody that knows how to smile. So are we looking at that component, James, too? Yes, ma'am. And, and I have asked candidly uh, a number of builders, developers, folks that come in in a one-on-one -on -one situation, you know, here's your chance to air the dirty laundry. Let, let me know what you really think, you know. And for the most part, we don't really get any negative comments about the process. Um, most of the comments tend to just be um, based around, you know, when the economics are, are more fitting, we'll be back booming in Douglas County. There's nothing preventing us but the bottom line and right now I can make more in whatever downtown Atlanta building the departments than doing it here or, or you know houses or whatever and that's just kind of a I guess good in a sense so that I know that the, the problem's not on my end that I need to make some immediate changes but it's bad because it's a little harder to change I wish I could just you know oh, well, we'll change this right now and fix it so um, but we're, we're asking that and I think the input's been positive so far, and I, I think you would agree. Same yeah, way. absolutely. I have a lot of candid discussions with engineers, owners, uh, to a lesser extent contractors, but we get we get far more positive feedback than we do negative, just about their experience and 
working with us and, and you guys. Um, you know, there's, like I said earlier, there's always opportunities for improvement. I've sat down with you know, my staff and had you know, call it pep talks over the past year just mm -hmm. to keep at the forefront of everybody's mind our number one job is customer service. Um, you know, everybody's got to meet the regs, but we can help them do that in a polite, professional manner, and that's critical. So that is something that we uh, we try to keep on the front burner. Thank you for that. Anything else? We'll leave it up later. Madam Chair? Okay. Mark? I'm good. Good meeting. Okay. There's nothing good else for this committee. Mm -hmm. This meeting stands adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.